Fatality, my diamonds that cold. Versace chunks, I hit my backstroke. Knock on the door. She at the back, bro. Welcome back to Houdini is Hip. In the previous part, we looked at how we can work with flip fluids. We looked at the basics and really we only looked at sourcing. In this next part, what I want to look at is a much more complex shot. This is gonna be the first part in the series where we're actually working towards a production ready shot. So this is something you may do if you're working for a studio or if you're freelancing. This is the type of work that you might receive from a client. So I'm going to show you the type of process that I would usually take when working through a project like this. And this next part is probably going to be broken down into three parts. So this first part, I'm just going to be doing some setup and things and explaining foundational understandings. The second part is probably going to be the most complicated. And then the third part is mostly going to be rendering. So what exactly are we doing? Well, very commonly, you'll see adverts for champagne or beer. And those scenes are often done with VFX. Now we're going to be doing a non-alcoholic version, which is doing sparkling water. Right. Now the look is quite different. You don't have as much of that foam collection as you do with champagne or beer. But I do also think that that makes it a bit more interesting because we have to take a bit more of a nuanced approach to the particles that collect at the top. So let's go ahead straight into Houdini. We'll begin with just some basic setup stuff and then we'll just ramp this up until we're getting into some of the most complicated things that we've covered thus far. So let's go straight ahead. In Houdini, I'm going to go ahead and drop a geometry node and just call this glass. All right, go ahead and drop a curve node. So we're just gonna drop a curve node over here. We haven't used this one yet. Let's go into our viewport, press space and three on your numpad to go into the front viewport. You can also click over here, set view, front viewport. This will lock us to an orthogonal view of our front viewport. We can then go over here to our transform handles and with our curve selected, we're going to just draw out the shape of a glass. We're not gonna draw out the entire shape. We're just gonna draw out the one side of it. So something like that. Then go ahead and use a revolve node. So revolve over here. And what that'll do is it'll take our curve and spin it around, turning it into a geometry. Press space plus one to return to your perspective viewport. And this is what we've ended up with, right? Now, what we want to do over here is make some changes to our revolve. The first thing we're gonna do is make sure that we don't have this blue tinting on the outside. This means that our faces are reversed. You can see the ones on the inside are the regular gray. The ones on the outside are this blue color. So just reverse the cross sections. Over here, we're gonna add some end caps so that it closes the top and the bottom. And we don't actually need UVs, so we can disable compute UVs, All right, So we just end up with something like that. Okay, that's cool. So now let's just go ahead and blast the top of this. So we're just gonna use a blaster node over here, click on this group over here, the arrow, and select the top face, press enter. That'll just blast that away. Then we're gonna use a poly extrude node we're going to extrude our glass out a bit. So just increase the distance. Something that seems reasonable. So 0 0.7. And I'm going a bit heavier on it than I usually would because I'm going to be using a subdivide and that's going to smooth it out. We can also just output the back face so that this is a closed piece of geometry. And from there, we can go ahead and use a subdivide. So just subdivide this over here. Give it maybe three divisions, right? So something like that. So you can see we end up with this very smooth tumbler type glass and it looks pretty good. You can make changes to this. Of course, the cool thing is you can always go back to this curve over here and you can make changes to it. So if I switch the mode over here to this first one, that's going to be for editing and I can edit the points on this curve, right? So you can do all sorts of things. This curve node with revolve is super useful. You can do all sorts of really cool things with it. It's useful for making things like fountains and making things like statues. You can do all sorts of really cool things, making vases, but yeah, just play around with it until you end up with a shape that you're happy with. I basically just want something like this. So I'm going to settle for that, right? Cool. So I've got my glass. So now the only thing that I want to fix is the transformation and orientation of this. As you can see, it's going through the ground plane a bit. We don't really want that. And it's also massive, right? This is about one meter in height, so it's massive for a glass. What we're gonna do is transform it down until it's about 15 centimeters, maybe like 20 centimeters. So we'll go uniform scale of 0 0.2, right? Something like that. That's assuming that we now have it scaled down to about 20 centimeters. The next thing that we're going to do is just use a match size. So a match size over here is extremely useful for aligning things to a particular position. So over here where it says justify Y, we don't want center to same, we want min to same, right? So what that'll do is if we go before over here, you can see that it was going through the ground. After we've used this match size, it now fits exactly on the ground plane. 
this is extremely useful for making sure that things sit on the ground plane and you don't have to you know manually get them to rest on the ground plane this kind of just checks the bounding box of this thing and then sticks it onto the ground plane cool so now we can add a null and this is just going to be our glass out glass out i'm going to go ahead and save this so i'm just going to make a new directory in houdini's hip called carbonated and i'm just going to call this part one so part one dot hip for carbonated right so i would suggest you do the same and just save this as we're going but that's all we have for now cool so let's actually begin on creating a simulation so we can make use of this glass we'll go over to the side over here and just drop a new geometry node we'll call this one fluid base dynamics dive inside and we can actually keep this glass ghosted over here what we're going to do is add a sphere and having this glass ghosted just makes it a lot easier for us to align this as a source so we're going to scale this down to about 0 0.04 and we're going to move this up and over to the side. What we basically want is for there to be some velocity coming from the side into the glass, right? So we're not dropping it directly down. It's coming from the side into the glass, right? We'll end up with some nice swirling and things. So that's pretty cool. Now we have this sphere over here, but we actually want it to scale down over time, right? I want the sphere to, as it goes, we're just going to scale it down and taper off this sourcing. So at frame 48, we're going to go over to the uniform scale, press Alt, click on uniform scale, move over a bit to frame 54, Alt and click, and then just drop this uniform scale to zero. So between those frames, it'll shrink down to nothing. So that just mimics the idea that we're pouring in water, and then we're done pouring at around 48 frames, right? Okay, so that's pretty nice. We have our sphere over there, and that's going to be our source. Now we're going to go ahead and use a flipped dop source, right? As we've done before, flipped dop source, Right over here and as we saw in the previous part we need to make sure that our voxel size and particle separation matches the scale of our scene All right so because the sphere is so small 0.04 we should do something smaller than 0.04 so the size of your source is usually going to give you a good indication of what your scale should be so i would say usually a safe range for what you're sourcing is going to be about a tenth of what the scale is for your source object so if we have 0.04 we can assume that 0.004 is going to be good over here. So we're going to go 0.004 over there and 0.004 over there. And we end up with that, right? So it's looking pretty good. That's pretty high resolution, but it plays back at a decent rate. So it's not too much of an issue to have it at this resolution. We will be making changes for testing purposes. We might push this higher. We might go lower. It all depends, right? So we also want a velocity. So over here, we can activate velocity. And let's add a velocity in the negative x direction, because if we look in the bottom left, we have the x direction, which is moving towards the right. And so we want to kind of add some velocity towards the negative x direction. Just go ahead and say negative 0.8, something like that. It might be a bit much, but we'll come back and make adjustments to it. And if we switch on our point rails, you can see that it's kind of going that way. You can also add some downward velocity to make it seem like it's actually pouring out from a bottle and is already kind of gathering momentum before the simulation plays, but it's okay as it is, right? Those are just changes that you can make if you feel it's necessary. Go ahead and drop a null. Plug this in over here. This is just going to be our flip source. Now, just a refresher. This is going to be two parts. It's going to have a surface, right? That's going to be the VDB. And then it's going to have a particle group, right? So if we just use something like a blast node, then we can see this. So if we go over here and we blast the particles, we just have the surface. If we blast everything but the particles, we just have the particles, right? So you can see that it's two things that make this up. And the velocity is being carried on the actual points, right? Because if it is being carried on the volume, then you would have to have a velocity volume. It wouldn't just be surface. Surface is just this one that represents the surface of the fluid. But as you can see, we have a point attribute called V. So that's velocity. And that exists on the actual particles, not in the volume. All right, cool. So we can now feed this into a flip simulation. But before we do that, I want to also just set up the colliders for the glass. So let's go ahead and we can actually do it inside of this glass over here. So we have this glass out. What we're going to do is we're going to grab two nulls. We're going to directly take this null into here and we're going to call this glass surface out, right? So that's the one. And over on this side, we're going to make another one. And this one is going to be glass volume out. Right. So this one on the left is fine as it is. We're just going to leave it. This one on the right, we're going to use a VDB from polygons. VDB from polygons right over here. 
And this one over here, we're going to use to convert this into a surface volume, right? So as you can see, we have a distance VDB over here or a fog VDB over here. We've worked mostly with fog VDBs. If we go over here and we switch this on, this will also switch our background to dark. If we decrease the voxel size to increase the resolution, so 0 0.005, you'll see that we have this glass, right? And it's represented now as a volume because we've converted it to a fog VDB, which is made up of density, right? We don't really want a fog VDB. We want a surface VDB. So we have that over there, an SDF, right? So we just want this over here and we can decrease the voxel size even more, 0 0.003 to even one, right? So pretty high resolution. Okay, so that is a volume. Again, you can see over there that it is a volume. It's a VDB. So we just have this glass over here and that's going to be the glass volume out. So we have the surface and the volume. And I'm going to show you why we have two of them. It's actually a technique used sometimes in production to ensure more accurate collisions where we use both a surface and a volume. And I'm going to be showing you how to do that. So let's go over here to the fluid based dynamics. Inside of here, we can, of course, use a DOP net. And that is what we're going to be using for this, the DOP network. So let's go ahead and rename this DOP net to flip fluid solver. Let's dive inside of this flip fluid solver. And inside of here, we're going to drop a flip solver. So just to clarify, the flip solver inside of a DOP context or dynamics context, as you can see in the top right of this window over here, is different to the one at the geometry level, right? This flip solver over here, oh, whoops, flip solver, this one over here is different, right? This one has all of our settings at this level and it deals with everything basically. It does gravity and all of that stuff. This one over here is different. So this flip solver is more bare bones, right? It's just a component of the sub level flip solver. Cool, so let's go ahead and add a flip object. Flip object into the left input over here. Go back to frame one and you'll see this big mess of spheres. We don't want an initial volume, so we can remove that. Then we can go ahead and just add our volume source over here into the last input. The sub path is going to be over here in fluid based dynamics, flip source, just choose that and initialize to source flip. Now we still have these massive spheres. We're going to go over to guides and particles, visualization, switch it to particles so that we just have this over here. Now our particle scale is going to be really weird. We also have this issue over here where we have these giant bounds. So go over to the flip solver, volume motion, change your box size to one by one by one. And then just to ensure that the actual source isn't lying outside of the box, move it up by 0 0.5 on the Y axis, just so that we have something like that, right? Okay, so we have that in place. Now our particle separation over here is not very good. We want to link this particle separation to the flip source separation over here and the voxel scale. So what we can do is we can grab it from here. So particle separation, click copy parameter and paste it in these two fields. Paste relative references, paste relative references, right? The reason we're doing it this way, where we have this one affecting these two is because it makes more sense than having these two affecting this one, because we're going to be working in this sort of context more often than working outside of it. So it's nice to have control over everything from this single control and affecting these two out here with that, rather than having to jump up each time to make a change. So let's go ahead and change the particle separation back down to 0 0.004. And we just have that over there. Play this back and we don't have any gravity. So it just shoots off to the side. Go ahead and drop a gravity force over here. Start again, play it back. And there we just have it, right? It's just this stream of particles. Now our source doesn't look very interesting because it's basically just perfect, right, as it's going. So we need to make some changes to how it's being sourced. Over here on the flip source, after we've done this, let's just add an attribute noise over here. We're going to set this to V, V over there, to affect our velocity. Let's take a look at our velocity trails, and you can see that it's affecting it way too much. So drop the amplitude to something like 0 0.01, and then we're going to set it to zero centered. Let's increase our amplitude to 0 0.1, 0 0.15, something like that looks good. And then scale down the element size to something like 0 0.1 as well. We're then going to add animation to it and decrease the pulse duration to something low like 0 0.15. If we play it back, this is what we end up with where there's just a little bit of movement. So that's going to be useful for not having that perfect stream of particles. 
And if we go back and try it again, let's see what we have. Right, so that adds a little bit of something to it. We can make some changes to this so that it's a smaller element size, 0 0.05. We can also increase the roughness. So go over to Fractal, increase the roughness. Try that. And that's probably better, right? The other thing that we can also do is on the flip source over here, we have this Jitter scale and Jitter seed. We can actually change this Jitter seed to dollar FF. What this will do is each and every time we run this and calculate the particle positions, it'll adjust them slightly. So let's take a look at what this looks like with a blast node. So if we blast everything but the particles, over time you can see how they jump around, right? So they're not consistent. If we were to change this, so let me just set this back to what it was, right? Zero over here. Then you can see that they all stay static. The second that we make this time dependent by doing dollar FF, or frame, that's just fetching the frame number, we end up with that jitter. Okay, so that's cool, right? Back in here, we just have that. And once it reaches frame 48 or so, it just disappears, right? So that's what we have. Cool, let's go ahead and set up our colliders now. We can go ahead and use a static object for this, and we're going to need to merge it in. So let's merge this over here, before gravity, after gravity, doesn't really matter. Make sure that the collider is coming into the left side of the merge node, so you can switch them around over here. Alternatively, setting it to mutual does the same thing for us. So on the static object, we have some options. Let's go ahead to our salt path over here and go to glass. We're gonna grab glass surface out. You can see that it brings in our glass. This isn't exactly what we want. If we go over to the collisions tab and take a look at the collision guide, you'll see that we have that blue collision geometry being shown over there. And then we can display our geometry or we can hide it. And if we hide it, we can see what we have, right? This collider doesn't look exactly how we want it. And also this big box is kind of making things awkward for navigation. So I'm gonna go over to my flip solver and just deactivate the visualize limits. Okay, back to the static object. This static object is not exactly how we want it to look. It's a bit rough, and in a lot of cases, it's just not going to be as accurate as we want it to be. So instead of allowing it to generate this collision for us, what we can actually do is change the mode over here to volume sample. This is where that other volume that we created earlier is going to come into play. Under proxy volume at the bottom, go ahead and choose from your glass volume out. When we bring that in, we'll have a much higher resolution collision geometry over here. And this is the one that's being generated over here. We use this VDB from polygons and then output it. That's what we're seeing over here, right? That's what we're seeing. And this is a really good way of doing it, especially if you have deforming geometry, because what you can do is you can actually calculate your colliders. So let's just say that you have a really complicated creature that's like breaching an ocean surface. What you can do is you can say clip it to only where it's interacting with the surface. You can file cache that to disk. And then because it's file cached to disk, this flip solver won't need to calculate it every single frame, right? So deforming geometry, usually it would have to calculate a collision guide every single frame. But if we explicitly say we want this to be our volume, then it doesn't have to calculate it. It can just pull it from this over here. And this could be saved to disk. We can make all sorts of changes to this at the SOP level. It's really good to do it like this. It gives us a lot of flexibility. Now, I'm just going to play this back and I want to show you an issue that we have with this. Now you'll see these particles flying out through our volume and this isn't actually an issue with our glider. Sometimes there's just not really that much we can do about it. We can remedy it by increasing things like substeps and things like that but we don't really want to be doing that. Not necessarily and not right now. So let's rather correct this issue now and then we can increase our substeps if we have to. Substeps should be sort of last resort, something that you should only do if you really need to do it. So over here, this is actually a weakness of volume colliders. Volume colliders are great at ensuring movement along a surface. So as you can see, these particles that sort of like move along the surface, but they're not great at tracking these sorts of collisions where it's passing through. So what we can do is actually also use a surface collider. Now, how do we know whether we're using volume or surface colliders? You can see over here that on the static object, it says use solver default. For the flip solver, your solver default is going to be volume collisions. So it's the same as setting it as volume collisions, right? That won't actually change anything. This is now a volume collision. However, we can also change this to a surface collision. Now, I just wanna hide our collision guide over here and change this to a surface collision. Then go over to the surface tab and say show collision radius. 
And this is something different, right? This one over here is just the actual surface that we're bringing in. So this over here on the left-hand side, this over here, this geometry, it's just using that surface as a collider, right? So it's not a volume collision. The issue is that when we play this back, it doesn't behave so nicely. You can see that if we look inside, the fluid doesn't really play too nicely with the inside of this glass. It does some weird things and there's some volume loss and all of that, but it doesn't penetrate the glass. So a really cool trick that we can do is to actually use both a surface collider, so having it as surface collisions, and a volume collider. So just click Alt and drag this over. That'll make a duplicate. And on this one over here, I'm just gonna hide show collision radius, and I'm going to switch this back to use volume collisions. So the one on the left over here is using surface collisions. The one on the right is using volume collisions. And then we just merge these two together. And we end up with the best of both worlds. So I'm just gonna hide both over here, play this back. And as you can see, we get that nice movement that you get from volume collisions. And we also ensure that we don't have any of those particles going through our collider because we're using surface collisions. So it's just a nice trick. You can use both surface collisions and volume collisions. And this will actually help your simulation quite a bit in terms of accurate collision detection. For simulations where we're doing something with like large scale water simulation and we don't need it to be this accurate, I would forego the surface collisions and just use volume collisions, right? So ignore surface collisions, just use volume collisions. Surface collisions can get quite expensive. So once again, don't use that, try to use volume collisions. Cool. So we play this back and we expect our fluid to fill up the glass, but it doesn't really do that, right? We have the fluid slowly filling up, but it's not really the amount that's coming in. You can see that there's a little bit of a disconnect between the amount that's going in and the amount that's kind of staying in the glass. But you can see that eventually we have our fluid that's just kind of coming to rest in our glass. And that's quite nice. Now, you will notice that it does lose volume over time. It'll actually kind of collapse in on itself over time, and that isn't what we want. There's a couple of things that we need to take note of, right? Okay, so for this part, I'm just going to bring up my drawing app so that we can revisit the concept that we looked at in the last part. Okay, so in the previous part, we looked at this concept of there being particles and voxels. One thing that I want you to take note of is that in a flip simulation, because we have both particles and volumes, they actually work back and forth to maintain the level of particles that we require, right? So let's just say that we have some voxel, so some little block, that's a field, right? So that's not a particle, that is a field. That's once again looking at Eulerian. Inside of that, we could have, you know, any number of particles, right? So a number of particles inside this particular voxel. What happens is if the density of particles in here is too high, so let's just say we have two situations, right? It's too high or it's too low, right? So too high or too low. Then we should do one of two things. If it's too high, then we should kill particles to get us to our required particle separation. In our case, we know it's that value of like 0 0.004. If it's too low, we should birth particles. So we should add particles to the simulation to bring us up to the required level to maintain fluid volume levels, right? So this over here, is what you'll commonly see referred to as reseeding, reseeding, right? When you reseed your simulation, you're checking for voxel densities. If the particles in the voxel are too low, you birth some new particles to meet a threshold. If there's too many particles, then you kill some. Now, an interesting thing that happens, and this might not just be from reseeding, there's a couple of other things that it does, like the surface level and all of that, but we're not gonna look at that too much. But the idea is that we have our glass, Right, so we just have our glass over here. And our particles are coming in as this fluid. And when they interact with the surface, you end up with particles all going from a very high velocity, so this is a very high velocity zone, to a very low velocity zone, right? They're suddenly stopping when they hit this glass. And what happens is particles will stack on top of each other. So let's just say we have like four particles or three particles, and they're all kind of moving in this direction, right? When they impact the glass, so when they impact our glass, they're all kind of going to stack on top of each other, right? They're going to stack on top of each other. And then reseeding is going to kick in, and it's going to be like, hey, wait, there's too many particles here. Let's kill some of them. So all of that volume that you had over here, right? So you had maybe three particles going in. They collide, and you still have three. But then it gets reseeded, and you end up with a situation where all you're left with is actually one particle, right? You have one particle over there. 
that's an issue because we're losing volume, right? We're going from three, it's all getting compressed together. It's getting read in this voxel as there being too high of a density. So let's kill particles to maintain a density and you end up with just one particle, right? So you're losing you know, a third of your volume in this situation. Now, there's a couple of solutions to this. Firstly, we can look at substeps because if we have enough substeps, then these particles will collide with each other, right? This one will be over here and it'll be like, oh wait, this particle's in the way, I can't go through it. So I'll just sit on top of it and I'll sit on top of it. And then it sort of maintains the kind of spacing that is required for us to not kill it, right? So this is just one understanding that I need you to have is that particles can all be kind of squashed together if we don't have enough substeps. And what can happen is then we can reseed it and kill them and end up with volume loss. Another thing that can happen is simply if some particles are at rest, this exact same thing can happen, right? So I'm just gonna hide this grid. I don't really need it right now. So let's also have the situation where we just have some particles at rest. You might have this issue. You might've had it before if you've worked in Houdini, but the idea is you just have some particles at rest, right? So they're all just kind of filling this glass. But I just want you to notice something, right? These particles over here, say there's like some particles that are sitting kind of like that, right? These are going to have lower densities than these over here because these are only surrounded by a few particles, right? While these ones are surrounded by many. So what it'll actually do is it'll kill off these particles, right? That top layer will be killed off. Then the new layer is gonna be here. And then this layer is gonna get killed off. And the new layer is gonna be here. And then this layer is gonna get killed off. And you're just gonna lose volume in your simulation. And there's other ways that this can occur, but the idea is if there's like weird spacing issues or grid scale issues, you're gonna lose volume. And so there's a couple of ways to work around this. And I'm gonna show you pretty much as many as I can, but oftentimes there are gonna be different causes for this. So do keep that in mind. You will have different causes for your volume loss in different simulations, but there's some ways to work around it. Perfect. So now back in Houdini, we know that we have this fluid and it's pouring into this glass. Let's make a few changes to ensure that firstly, we're not having this issue of losing volume, because as you can see, this is exactly the issue I was talking about. They're getting compressed down too closely because they're going from high velocity to low velocity. So they're all kind of stacking on top of each other. So we're losing some volume. That's why it's not filling up as it should. It's still filling up, but this isn't how much you would expect it to fill up, right? This filling rate seems a little bit off. So we're gonna have to make some changes. Okay, so the first thing I actually wanna change is going over to this volume motion tab. And we have this velocity transfer option over here of flip splashy. Splashy is just a calculation method that ensures that our fluid splashes around a lot, right? Now, if you want a fluid that doesn't splash too much and kind of just swirls around itself, you can change this from splashy to swirly. Alternatively, you can push up the velocity smoothing. Swirly is just a different method of velocity transfer. It tries to ensure that it's a more smoothed out velocity. So if we play this back, you'll end up with a less, well, splashy volume and it'll be more swirly, right? So we're now just ending up with swirling occurring in that volume. Okay, so that's cool, right? That's helping the movement of our simulation, but we still haven't addressed this issue of losing volume. So let's go ahead and actually just increase our substeps. Now you have two options of increasing substeps. Over here under the substeps tab, you have the max substeps over here. This is based on a CFL condition. Basically it tries to figure out when more substeps are needed and only uses it when they're needed. So if we increase this value to something like three, we can play this back and see what we end up with. And a lot of the time, this will actually fix your volume loss issues. And in this case, it might have. Again, it's tough to tell when you're playing it back at the speed, but we'll play it back afterwards and just see what we end up with. So then the fluid kind of tapers off and you can see we have much more volume in this fluid than we did before, right? It's at a much higher fluid level and it looks pretty decent. So let's just play this back and see what we have. Right, so that looks a lot better to my eye. There's of course some issues that I have. For example, I don't like these little bits of particles that kind of fly up. I think that they look a bit weird, but once again, we'll get to fixing that. Okay, so substeps kind of helped our one issue. The other thing that we can do is go over to the particle motion tab over here under separation. If we have particle separation applied, it'll try to move particles away from each other until we reach this particle separation. So all it's doing is it's trying to enforce that separation. This is also useful for maintaining a fluid level in your simulation. It'll try and push particles apart that are too close together and like collapsing in on each other. But we don't necessarily want such a high separation rate. We'll do something like 0.5 to test with. And what you should end up with is a more voluminous fluid, but also a more uniform distribution of points. 
It should feel as if they aren't sort of collecting in certain areas and doing weird things. This little particle separation thing, extremely useful for maintaining a fluid level once again. So these are just two tricks. So far, we just looked at substeps and we looked at particle separation, right? So cool, now our particles are trying to stay apart and they're not really collapsing down. So this is nice. We have this fluid that falls off this cup. It looks good. Okay, I just wanna show you one other thing that you can work on to ensure that particles are resolved correctly. And that is this grid scale over here. Grid scale isn't often adjusted that much, but basically the field size of your simulation. So when we look at voxels, what sort of voxel scale are we talking about? It's calculated by taking your grid scale, I believe it's your particle separation times your grid scale, and that gives you the field size, so the voxel size for your simulation. So if we decrease the grid scale, we're increasing the resolution of the grid, right, of the Eulerian side of things. So if we decrease this grid scale to something like 1.5, it's actually going to increase the resolution of our simulation. So our simulation is going to run a bit slower, but it's going to increase the fluid density inside of our simulation. Right, so we play this back and perhaps you can see that you end up with more volume in your fluid, right? There's a more voluminous fluid. And so this is also a change that you can make. I don't always make this change. I prefer to rely on other things first, but this grid scale is a good option. And for our situation over here, we might keep it at 1.5, right? So particle separation and then grid scale. And what you'll notice is that the actual resolution of our simulation has increased because the field resolution is based on particle separation and grid scale. So even though our particle separation has stayed the same, our grid scale has gone down, so our resolution has gone up. That's just something that I want you to keep in mind. Right, so it's a nice simulation, but we're now having perhaps too much fluid. So I'm going to just dial this back, right? But you play with these settings until you find something that works for you. So you can see at this level, I'm just having these particles pour over. I don't really like that. So grid scale can go up to like 1.75. And I'm not gonna play that back. It's probably going to be good enough for what I want. Okay. So let's go ahead and make a few more changes. Over here on the particle motion, right? So under the particle motion tab on your flip solver, I wanna add a few things. I want to add an ID attribute and I want to age particles. Now adding an ID attribute, all that does is it tracks the IDs of each particle so that you have something that's constant for the particles. And I'll explain why this is extremely important later. So just know that a lot of the time we do want this ID attribute, it's extremely useful. It also doesn't take up much space because it's just an integer. So it's not like a vector that's gonna stay on your points. It's just an integer. ID, extremely useful. Always consider adding ID if you're going to be doing things with your simulation post sim, which you are in most cases. Aging the particles just adds an age attribute that tells you the age of the particles throughout the simulation. So newly sourced particles are gonna be younger and then particles that have been around for a while are gonna be older and we can do certain things based on that. Now, these are going to be saved as attributes. And if we go up a level and just switch our display flag over here. So over here under the object, the only thing that we want is actually that flip object. So go over here and just select flip object. That's the only thing that we actually want, right? So we just have these particles coming out. I'm just gonna add a null over here, and we're just gonna call this fluid particles out, right? So these are the particles that are coming out of our simulation. And I just wanna show you the attributes that exist on it. You'll see that there's a whole bunch of attributes. We have life, we have dead, we have age, we have all of these weird things going on. Most of them, you don't really need to worry about. The solver is actually using a lot of these behind the scenes, but the ones that we added, it's just ID over here. So you can see that each and every ID is unique. We also have life and we have age, right? So age, as these particles get older, you can see at their age. And this is cool because we can also do things like this. I just wanna show you a way of visualizing it. If we drop down a color node and we go ramp from attribute, we can choose something like age and let's ramp it as black body and ghost other objects. I just wanna show you that as this age increases, so the particles that have been around for a long time, they're getting older, so it's moving up this way, right? And this is in seconds. So after 24 frames, you're gonna have ages of one, right? So you can see over here, age is approaching one, right? If I go one frame more, age is now one for all of them, right? So you can see which particles have been around for long. Okay, so that's one thing, but there are actually other attributes that you can add to your simulation to really control the way that it looks. There's three that I want you to focus on. And maybe even two, I'll, I'll reduce it to two, right? So let's go over here to the volume motion on our flip solver. Under viscosity, we have this over here where it says enable viscosity. 
We have viscosity by attributes currently grayed out. Same thing with density, density by attribute. And we also have divergence. These are the three main ones that I want us to focus on. Divergence, you can sort of ignore for now. Um, I'm not gonna worry about it too much. Density and viscosity are the two that you're gonna be using most for small scale simulations. And to quickly explain what viscosity is, it's simply the thickness of the fluid. So fluids that are thicker tend to share their velocity with their neighbors a lot more. If you think of honey, and perhaps honey being made up of loads and loads of particles, you can think of all of the particles moving in a very similar way, right? They all share a very similar velocity when you're sort of pouring honey out. If you look at something like water, each and every water particle could have very different velocities, right? It's very splashy. So viscosity is basically the thickness of the fluid. Now, if we go over to density, we have this density by attributes being controlled by an attribute. Now, density is basically the weight of the fluid. And that's not entirely correct terminology, but the idea is that you have a density of a thousand and a thousand represents water because one milliliter of water is one gram. So in a liter of water, you have a thousand grams. So you can actually do that same calculation and you can work out whichever fluid you need, right? So as density increases, you end up with something that's a heavier fluid per milliliter, right? So the amount of fluid that you have is heavier. So that's the idea behind it. And these are all controlled by attributes. And quickly, divergence, um, just in case you're interested, this is an attribute which kind of pushes particles apart, right? They diverge away from each other. So they almost expand. This is useful for things like foam and stuff. Uh, we will be using it at some point, but we don't need to worry about it too much. Density and viscosity are the two that we're interested in right now. Fortunately, the attribute names are viscosity, density, and divergence. So if we enable viscosity and say viscosity by attribute, and also go up to our flip object, we go over to the initial data and tell it that we actually want a viscosity attribute, then we can start messing around with viscosity. So it's just those three things that you have to change. Add viscosity on the actual flip object, enable viscosity under the volume motion, and also do viscosity by attribute. Don't worry about viscosity with adaptivity. That might sound like varying viscosity where you have like some low viscosity and high viscosity areas. That's not what it means. Viscosity with adaptivity is just about the adaptive solving. So again, don't worry about that. We won't really be focused on that. Okay, so I just wanna show you what that means for us. Now that we have viscosity active, let's just go ahead and add an attribute wrangle over here and actually initialize that viscosity attribute. So we'll just say at viscosity equals 50, right. So this should work. And this weird occurrence of here happens, right? Where this should technically be going into our glass over here, but there's clearly an issue. And this is actually something that I hadn't really seen before because most of my colliders didn't really have this issue. So I just wanna go back to our glass over here, the glass geometry, and I wanna show you something. So over here on this VDB, you can see that it creates this box around our VDB. Now, notice how close this box edge is to the top of our VDB. This is actually what's causing that issue. And so this is a bit of a unique case where the collider's edge is actually exactly in an area which is gonna cause us some issues. This is just something that will sometimes pop up in your projects. There'll be weird things that happen and you kind of need to troubleshoot them. The thing that we're going to do over here is increase the exterior band voxels over here. So push that up to 10. What that allows is this little bit of space over here so that the VDB can function correctly. What's currently happening, and I'm not sure exactly why it happens when we have our viscosity and not otherwise, but it actually views this as a closed off surface. So we're just gonna set this to 10 and that will fix our issue. So we can go back and give this another run and see what happens. There we go, so now it works. I'm just going to hide this collider again and we can see what we have. Right, so as you can see, viscosity makes this fluid much thicker. You can see how it's now sort of gathering just in the one corner of the glass. If we play this back, you can see how thick that fluid is, right? So that's just an example. I just wanted to show you how viscosity works, right? We enable our viscosity over here and we drive it with a viscosity attribute. Now, this is actually going to become useful because if we go lower on this viscosity, so just something like 0.1, what you'll see is that we still have something that more or less behaves like water or a very thin fluid, but it kind of holds its shape a lot better, right? It maintains its shape. The other thing that I want you to note is that some of these particles over here stick to the edges of the glass. That has to do with the slip scale on collision. So viscosity tends to make things sticky, right? You'll end up with a much more sticky fluid if you are working 
with viscosity. And so you can enable slip on collision, right? So slip on collision over here. The default for slip scale will be 0.1, but this is oftentimes not enough. So we can maybe do something like 0.3. Let this play back. And what it should do is those particles over there should now slide back down and join back in with the fluid. Yeah, so it prevents those little particles from kind of sticking to the side of the glass. And this is just a useful thing to know, right? So when you're working with viscosity, if you don't want it to have that stickiness upon collision, you can enable slip scale and it'll slip down the collision, right? So you can end up with something like this. So why am I telling you about viscosity now? Well, that's because we're actually going to be using viscosity for the areas where there's bubbles, right? Because our foam layer actually behaves more like a viscous fluid than it does as if it were water. It behaves more like a thicker fluid than it does a thinner fluid. So we're going to be using viscosity for that. Right now, I'm just going to set my viscosity on this attribute wrangle back to zero. And let's take a look at another important attribute. Over here, we have density. I'm going to go ahead and enable density. We can leave our viscosity settings as they were with slip scale and everything. We're now going to be looking at density. If we enable density and we play back our simulation, you would assume that this would add the density attribute over here to our geometry spreadsheet, but it doesn't. There is no density attribute. You can check it by typing density over here, right? It just assumes that all of these particles currently have a density of 1000 if there is no density that has been defined. The important thing about density is not the density itself, but the difference in density. So what do I mean by that? Well, what's important when we're working with density is inside of this fluid, which particles have a lower density and which particles have a higher density because higher density particles are going to tend to sink and low density particles are going to tend to rise. So what is that going to be useful for? That's going to be useful for things like bubbles, right? Our bubbles are going to be little trapped pockets of air, so they have very low density, so they float to the top. Our water, however, is going to have a higher density, so it's going to sink to the bottom. That's how you end up with those two distinctive layers of water and foam. That's going to be particularly useful if you're looking at something like a beer or champagne simulation. And in our case, it's still going to be important. So let me show you how this works. All I'm going to do on this attribute wrangle where we set our viscosity is I'm going to just add a little expression. I'm going to say if, and this is just a conditional. So if, and then we open brackets and inside of these brackets, if a condition's met, then the things inside these curly brackets that follow the if statement will get run. Okay. So this, if whatever in these brackets returns true, do whatever's in here, right? That's sort of the format of an if statement. So in here we can say if, and we're going to say at frame with a capital F less than 24, then let's make our density equal to 200. Density equals 200, right? Something like that. And then we're going to add something after this if statement where we say else, and then we open new curly braces. And in here we can say at density equals 1000. Okay, so what am I doing? I'm saying if this condition is true, then set my density to 200. Otherwise, set my density to 1000. If all statements are extremely useful for controlling logical flow. So you have something like this where you say, if our frame or our current frame is less than 24, our density is 200. If it's greater or equal to 24, make our density 1000. And we can actually see this if we go to our geometry spreadsheet and we click over here, we can see that our density over here is 200. And as we go towards 24, we get a thousand. So anything after 24 will have a density of a thousand. Okay. So that's kind of cool because now what we can do is we can go into our simulation over here and we can play this back and you won't notice anything different immediately. That's because we don't really have a way of visualizing the two different densities just yet, but I'll show you how to visualize that shortly. Okay. So let's go ahead and add a color node. Color nodes are extremely useful for just ramping things by certain attributes. And so we can go over here to color type ramp from attribute set this to density. We know our minimum density is 200 and we know our maximum is 1000. And if we do that, you can now see the difference over here, but let's just give this two distinct colors. So if it's low, we'll give it a color of white. And if it's high, we'll give it a color of blue, right? Sort of mimicking this idea of foam being low density and water being high density. So if we play this back, you'll see something cool, right? So over there, that's where that change occurs. This is all going to be that density of 200 based on this attribute wrangle that we're feeding in over here. And then after frame 24, it's going to switch right to the high density fluid. So to the one that's 1000 because of this if else statement, if frame is less than 24, do this, otherwise do this. 
So that's what we're ending up with over here. And now I want to show you what happens, right? As you can see, all of the blue liquid or blue particles, they go towards the bottom and our low density particles come towards the top. And this is extremely useful, right? This is exactly the situation that we need to achieve when we're working with something like foam. So we have the situation where low density, high density, and then they separate, right? So we end up with this nice separation based on density. Again, a density of 1000 is the density of water. If you're going higher than 1000, then you're no longer trying to replicate water. This is just 1000 grams per liter, right? That's the density over there. And so that's what we've ended up with. Okay, cool. So now that we have this, let's try to think of a way to actually utilize this in a more nuanced approach. Because currently we're just saying, okay, here's some low, here's some high, mix them together. What we actually want is for these low density particles to be created based on some other condition. So how about if when they hit the glass, they start emitting some foam, right? So some of these particles get turned to foam based on some parameter. Now, what can we use to define what gets turned to foam? This is going to bring us onto another useful attribute. So over here, I'm just going to go and I'm going to remove this if statement over here. I'm going to set our density to 1000, right? We're just initializing it. Initializing your attributes is always a good idea so that nothing defaults to a value that you don't intend to have, right? So for example, if we didn't set this to 1000 over here and then we make some changes in our flip fluid solver, we could end up with a situation where some of our particles that are being sourced in end up with a density of zero and then our simulation would break. So we just make sure that every particle has a density of 1000. We're initializing it over here. Okay, so let's move on to our next issue. How do we define which areas are going to be areas that are kind of hitting the glass or areas that are turbulent? Well, there's a really useful attribute in the flip solver. If we go over to the particle motion tab, let's go over to vorticity and say add vorticity attribute. And vorticity is just the swirling in a simulation. So I'm going to, once again, let this just run for a bit, and I'm going to show you what the vorticity actually looks like. Okay, so let's take a look at this in our geometry spreadsheet. We can go over here and just see what our vorticity looks like right over here. Vorticity ranges from 0 to 270. So let's once again use our color node over here, this time for vorticity. And we're going to set the range from 0 to 280, right? Just to make sure we get the entire range. I'm going to flip this around, make this darker. Okay, so perhaps now you can see what we're ending up with, right? These are the areas of high vorticity. You can see that as the fluid's coming in, it's not really swirling, there's no distortion to it, so vorticity is low. But when it starts swirling around in this glass, we end up with high vorticity. So areas like this, where it's hitting the glass and kind of spinning about, that's going to cause high vorticity. Now, you can see that this vorticity is kind of blurring out over time, right? And that's going to be because of this preservation rate that we have on our vorticity attributes. What we can do is we can reduce this preservation rate to something like 0 0.05 or even lower, 0 0.01, right? So a fairly low value. And what that'll do is it won't maintain the vorticity for as long. And what that's going to allow us to do is to very closely define which areas are high vorticity, because all we really care about is that initial swirling that occurs upon impact, right? So let's just take a look at this and let's narrow this range over here, right? So if we narrow it in, you can see that that's the area of highest vorticity, right? Those particles over there. Play this back. And that is going to be a pretty good area to emit low density particles from, right? That is more or less how particles are going to be spawned because we're pouring a fluid into a glass and because it's like tumbling and rolling over itself, we're going to end up with loads and loads of little air bubbles. So let's use that, right? Let's use the higher end of the vorticity range to emit some foam particles. Okay, so now it's starting to get a bit complicated, right? Just a recap. We have viscosity, which controls the thickness of our fluid. Currently, it's zero, so we just have water. Density controls how light or heavy our fluid is, and it's only really important when we have varying densities. So low densities will rise and high densities will sink. At the moment, we have it set to 1000 for all particles because all of our particles are initially going to be considered as water. We also have this vorticity attribute over here, and this vorticity attribute tells us how much swirling we have in our simulation. Okay, cool. So inside of here, let's once again, just look at the settings that we had to enable for this. We had viscosity, enable, and viscosity by attribute. We also had to go over to the flip object, go over to initial data, and just say add viscosity attribute. Then we had density. We enabled the density attribute. 
in particle motion, we had vorticity, and we don't really care about maintaining vorticity, we just care about the initial swirling, so we reduced the preservation rate. Okay, cool. Now, let's go ahead and figure out a way to group certain points based on vorticity. For this, we're going to be using a pop group. So pop group over here. Pop group gets plugged into the particle velocity input. So that's that second input over there. And by default, it doesn't actually do anything, right? So over here, we need to give this a group name. This is going to be our foam, right? What we want is we also want to preserve this group. This is important because each and every frame, we want to be adding foam to our foam group. We don't want to reinitialize our foam group every frame. We care about an accumulation of foam, not just one frame's foam. So we say preserve group. So particles that are supposed to be in this group get added to the group that was existing, right? So we end up with an accumulation of foam over time. Over here, we say enable, and this is rule-based, right? So you can see that by default, it's just saying in group equals one. This over here, this in group, is something that's pretty unique to popper angles, right? This is just a bit of a command inside of popper angles, and it's just saying, put this into the group, right? One equals true, zero equals false. So zero equals not in the group, one is in the group. And so over here, we can once again use a conditional. We can say if something, right, some condition is true, then we just wrap this in some curly brackets like this, press tab over here to indent this, tab indents. And now we can say, if some condition is true, then put these points into the foam group. And we already know what we want. We want if at vorticity is greater than some amount, we're going to choose 150 as a starting value. And let's just see if that works. Okay, so we go up a level and we play this back. And what we want, we can actually make a new color node over here. This one, we're just gonna set all of our points to this bluish color. And then we're going to make another color node over here. And this one, we're gonna say, make our foam white. This is just a nice way for us to visualize our foam points, right? So this one over here, make everything blue. This one over here, make our foam white. Okay, so let's play this back and see what kind of foam accumulation we end up with. So there, as you can see, we're now getting particles added to that foam group, right? This is based on vorticity. Anything that has a vorticity of 150 or more is going to be added to that foam group, right? So anything that's really swirling about quite violently, that's going to be added to a foam group. Now, currently, there's nothing to separate it, right? We're not telling our foam to do anything in particular. We're just adding it to a group. So we just have a little custom group called foam, and it's not really doing anything just yet. So inside of our flip fluid solver, what do we want it to do? Well, this is where we're going to need to use a pop wrangle, right? So after our pop group, we add a pop wrangle over here. And over here, we're gonna enable this group and we're gonna choose foam, right? So this is just something that we want only our foam particles to be influenced by. In here, all we're gonna say is at density equals 200, right? We can also say at viscosity equals 0 0.01, something like that. So now our foam particles that we're creating by using this pop group over here are going to get a lower density and a higher viscosity than the rest of the fluid. And if we once again jump up a level and play this back, you'll now see a really interesting thing where the particles that are part of the foam group are going to rise towards the top and they're going to kind of cling together because they have a higher viscosity. So I'm sure you can already more or less see that effect taking place, right? Those white particles are moving towards the top and their movement looks a bit more uniform, right? A bit more smoothed out than the rest of the fluid. And there we go, right? So that's what we have. All of those foam particles move towards the top and the dark blue particles stay towards the bottom and we're separating the concentration just like that. There's a few changes that I do want to make to this. I don't like how much fluid is actually ending up in the glass. So what I'm going to do over here is I'm just going to decrease my particle radius scale to something like 1.1, right? So if I play this back now, cool. So. There's multiple ways to do what I just did over there, where you reduce the amount of volume that's being brought in. What you could do is you could reduce the amount of time that this particle source is emitting for. You can decrease the size of the emitter. You can go over here. You can decrease your particle separation so that you have a higher resolution simulation. You can increase your grid scale. But what I did over here by decreasing this particle radius scale is I've made it so that each and every particle is considered slightly smaller than it was. 
And this is useful because what you end up with is more interesting movement in your simulation, especially for small simulations. I wouldn't necessarily do this for a large scale simulation, but for a simulation at this size, by decreasing the size that these particles are treated as, you're getting more interesting movement in your simulation and you're getting less volume, right? So the alternative is also true. If you were to push this value up, you would end up with a more smoothed out simulation, but you would also end up with more volume, right? So I'm just decreasing this slightly so that we have less volume in the simulation. Cool. And once again, it's separating quite nicely because we have this foam over here. The last two things that I'm going to do over here is just add a pop drag right over here. This adds a bit of air resistance. So we add our pop drag in over here and a value of one is really, really high. So let's just do something like 0.05. That's quite a low value, but do remember that this is going to be used every single frame. So it's going to be slowing things down every single frame. I do like to always add just a little bit of drag just so that you don't have crazy movement going on. It kind of tames everything a bit. The other thing that you'll often see is a pop speed limit. So a pop speed limit over here and you just say maximum speed and then you choose some maximum speed, right? So speed is going to be the length of your velocity vector. And so let me just move this away for a second. We can actually calculate what that value is. If we just let this play back, if we go over here and add an attribute wrangle, this is just for interest sake. What you can do is you can say at speed, or you can call it whatever you want, right? But we're going to call it at speed. And we're going to say is equal to the length of V at V, semicolon at the end. This little line of code is just going to calculate our speed value. So we can actually see what our speed value is. If we go over here, we can see that our speed range is from about 2.6 to zero, right? So that's useful because then we can use that in the pop speed limit over here. We can say, okay, anything faster than, let's just say four, right? Because we had values that were going between zero and 2.7 or so. And so anything higher than that is going to look odd. So we can limit it to a certain level. We're going to limit our speed to four, just so we don't have any crazy particle movement or anything like that. This is more of a safeguard than it is a look dev thing. You'll have a very similar looking simulation if you don't have this, but it is just good to have in place. Okay, so that's all we're going to do for this part, right? We can play this back and take a look at what we have. Okay, but basically we've gotten our particles to separate into foam and this fluid at the bottom. And in the next part, we're going to start working on smarter ways of actually separating these two over here. And we're going to work on ways of actually controlling certain attributes and things so that we have much better control over this simulation. Currently, we have many particles that are still kind of floating around inside of the fluid. We have a lot of extra movement that we don't necessarily want. And there's loads of things that we can improve about the simulation. So that's what we're going to be looking at in the next part. And we're also going to be looking at how we can then take this and mesh it and start looking at how we can create bubbles and things like that. Okay, so that's all for this part. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next time. Bye.